All right, gang, coming up on the show right now, we have a super cool guest. I'm excited. If you haven't watched this movie yet, you will definitely be seeing a lot more of it in your, your timelines and whatnot because uh, Kids vs. Aliens is a wild ride. And we say it all the time on this show, but uh, part of the wild ride, especially in horror, no matter what so subgenre it exists in, is the soundtrack that accompanies it. And I have got a very cool composer with us today, Mr. Andrew Gordon McPherson. Thank you for coming on board and joining us. Again, I talked to you before we started recording a minute ago. Congratulations on the soundtrack. It is pretty rad. The variety of sound that you uh, composed to accompany this kid's these kids' tales uh, was super, super dope. And the whole picture really kind of you know ties it up with a nice bow with your soundtrack on top, man. Thanks so much, Jimmy. It was a pleasure to be here, and I'm glad you liked the movie. It was a labor of love, for sure. So right off the get-go, you say the labor of love. When the news kind of came out that this was the spinoff of the VHS short, um, the VHS 93 short, had you seen that movie? Yeah. Um, well, I was a big fan of Jason's before I even... Jason Eisner, the director, before yeah. I even started uh, working with him so closely. And, uh, you know, I think that film actually uh, it was like like watchmojo.com's like declared it the like best alien abduction movie ever or something like in one yeah, of their yeah. Uh, yeah. famous countdowns. So, yeah, very familiar with it. Um, and, you know, I'm shocked they hadn't made a sort of a feature version of it. Uh, sooner especially with you know those sorts of accolades so it wasn't a surprise they were going to do it um but you know my first question is like what's it going to sound like like because i i don't there's no score really in the in the in the short so right the over the topness of the vhs series all the shorts that you know compose those things i think they all could uh and some of them have made really good horror feature films so the, the fact that this one got its own feature um especially in today's age where it seems like more originality from the horror genre is coming out than in like the last five to ten years really um this one being so like drastic from the norm of you know the pipeline of cinema where you know romantic comedy action film the rock the rock the rock vin diesel the rock like this thing uh when you guys do get to watch it if you haven't yet uh is literally about without getting into too many spoilers but aliens that are both fighting with each other but that fight happens upon like a kid's party that the kids uh, decide to have when the parents are out of town, which I don't know if you can relate to personally, but I sure shit can. <laughs> and so it's the perfect, like it's the perfect backdrop for this shit to happen. And then you as the composer, you get brought aboard and you're sitting there and you're watching this movie without any of your music to it. What was your first thought like going in? You know, you talked about meeting with the director about what it was going to sound like. Did you already have a clear vision in your mind about like the music you wanted to write or did you wait for him to send you stuff? Like what was your creative process like? Um, well, I read the script uh, before they shot it. Um, Jason had asked me to be in, I, I had done a lot of documentaries with Jason beforehand. He has a series called dark side of the ring, which is like a, a sort of like almost true crime wrestling documentary a, series that we could talk all day about that. I love that show, but <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I, I love it too. I'm really fortunate to get to work on it. So I did all the music on that series. And so when Jason's next feature was coming up, um, I think he had worked with a number of composers on hobo with a shotgun, but, uh, we had had such a close relationship over the course of all the dark sides. And so I was finishing up dark side season three and he sent me this script and 
uh he sent it to me on a thursday or friday and like over the weekend i wrote like 10 little sketches of ideas of music of you know uh just from ideas that i had from reading the script because the script i mean the script perfectly describes what you saw so you could i had a pretty good idea like how crazy it was going to be and sort of like what some of the big scenes and set pieces were and stuff so i'm i wrote a lot of music for him before he even shot which was kind of like what we end up doing on dark side of the ring a lot of the times and um he sent me other stuff that he liked like he sent me sound like he sent me a, a lot of uh obscure playstation one music which was mm. which is funny i think that he was just in a rabbit hole or, or uh, of uh of playstation one music that was kind of inspiring to him and then some obscure internet bands and classic score you know, like alan silvestri scores and uh and then he had some really weird stuff like there was a, a video of a guy playing a conch shell at an indoor pool he's like i really like this sound um so yeah i kind of like listened to all that stuff and i w- read the script and i and i made him some sketches and at that point it was kind of like a lot of just like high energy mostly synthy with some some orchestral elements and a lot of sound design so a lot of just to- weird tonal stuff mm-hmm. i think he played a lot of that stuff on the set especially when they were shooting like in the spaceship to kind of like get the actors in the vibe of like what being under in an underwater spaceship was going to be like yeah and um and you know some some stuff he played at the party and whatnot but uh uh yeah and then he edited the film as well so he put a lot of those demos in his first cut in different places not all not all necessary places where i had intended them to go but just worked really well and i built off of those and then wrote a whole bunch of new stuff right on man the the process that you do it i know a lot of people different composers will talk about like the use of any kind of uh, temp music or you know kind of audio loopy stuff were you drawing more from the stuff that you mentioned before that he had sent you kind of like on the side or did he did he uh, send you temp music too, or was the were you kind of the temp music when you were talking about writing those ske- sketches and stuff? Yeah, in a couple of scenes, he used sort of my my rough demos, but th- there's a lot of music in this movie. Even so, it's not a super long movie. There's music from I think Sorry. I think the movie's 80 minutes, and I wrote 85 minutes of music for the movie. So it's like it's you know from the first frame there's music right till after the credits so um and through the credits so um there was a lot of temp music in it and um uh yeah the the temp music thing um you know i worked for a long time as a picture editor actually i actually worked with jason as his assistant editor on on feature a number of years ago that's when our, our we sort of started our real tight you know collaboration i guess mm-hmm. uh, even though i'm main i'm pretty much 100 percent focused on scoring these days I, I started off doing editing picture editing so i understood why it's necessary to use it and i understand for a lot of filmmakers they don't necessarily have the vocabulary to express themselves to a composer and what they want so it's an easy shorthand and in fact like when i'm doing a spotting session with a director you know my one of my first questions is always like how close is this temp to what you're looking for now i'm never i'm never trying to copy it obviously and i find despite what i think a lot of other composers uh encounter i've not found directors too often to be like just copy this that Mm -hmm. that hasn't really happened to me that often knock on wood but there's there is uh sort of data that can be scraped from the temp music when you're going when you're going about starting to like write something new and usually it's like what's the tempo sort of what's the approximate ensemble that's playing like even just the difference between its orchestral and ethereal versus its its synths and guitars and a drum kit you know can can is a big distinction right Mm -hmm. and some people might not even 
like they would know enough to tell you the difference between an or- orchestra and a you know a rock band ensemble or something but maybe you're, maybe it's just easier to sh- to kind of show you like i want something like this and yeah. and so but and then my job is always just just like coming up with the themes and coming up with the elements that are going to like make the whole thing feel cohesive and there's always more you know storytelling that can be done with the score that can help the picture for sure uh no matter what the piece of music is the same way that any anything that you could shoot for the movie is better than almost any uh stock you know footage right. you could get right. you know yeah. unless it's something that it, like a tiger or something you couldn't get you know and you know some music is like that rolling stones or some big something that's in the psyche uh, you know but usually th- that stuff's written into the script anyway so i'm not even i'm not even competing with that so uh yeah that i mean the the temp music the temp music thing it's like i understand how it can like be a a thorn in people in composer sides but uh you know until we figure out a way to like see the picture and then send our music back in time to the editors when they're right. playing it uh, you know i don't know how else we're gonna go about that right yeah, the, your career path is very interesting because I've, I've interviewed you know actors who want, are going into directing or want to direct vice versa uh editors the, the same thing it, i feel like the the biggest uh, common denominator would be like uh dps and editing like have swapped that i have interviewed a lot but to go from editing to composing i think you are the first to be able to claim that they've done that on this show what what was the the inspiration was music kind of always number one and you found your way to composing or what was it that made you decide to go down that path um it's kind of a it was never a like it it was never a I'm only doing this until I can do this kind of situation. Right, I, sure. I, I'm really, I'm, you know, my formal education is, is I went to film school. I went to two different film schools. I went to the Nova Scotia community college screen arts program where I met Jason originally. And it was <laughs> like 20 years ago now. And, uh, and then I went to Sheridan college and just outside of Toronto, Ontario and did like a post-secondary thing where I specialized in sound for mm. motion pictures and actually directing. And then I ended up uh, working in a camera department uh, was the first job I got out of college. And that it was on a sort of early solid state camera, like a P2 Panasonic camera. So, and I was basically a second camera op. So I was dumping cards mm. and it was like the early days of like dumping cards mm-hmm. on set. Mm -hmm. Uh, or like what is now would be like called a dmt i guess Mm -hmm. um and so that was like kind of enough it was and and, you know i'm i live in canada so at that time i was living in nova scotia which has a like pretty decent little uh film industry there but you know i'm just you know it's really competitive to try and get in and there's not a lot of people there's not a ton of productions so it's kind of just doing whatever i could and then uh, so I went from kind of being a DMT to uh, I ended up moving to Montreal because I got a job um, at at Deluxe doing like quality control on Blu-ray discs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was like somehow I parlayed camera assistant into like like an office job where I was like making sure that the Hungarian subtitles came on when I select Hungarian. <laughs> And I did that for a year and then I got a job as like a post assistant at a, at a, you know, working on reality shows. And then I got to be an assistant editor and then I got to be an editor and then I got to cut some trailers and, and kind of while I was doing all of that, you know, and since I was in high school, I was like making music, producing music, making records, touring with different artists. And it was, you know, purely for fun uh i really loved it i come from a musical family i played in scrappy bands i made electronic music i made beats for rappers just just again just like doing whatever i thought was was fun and and i made a little bit of film music through through my film school days and whatever um 
and yeah around 2010 the music thing actually like really like took off for me a bit like i got invited to this thing called red bull music academy in london england uh where they bring like 60 kind of people from all over the world and you basically go into a bunch of studios and you go to lectures and you make music for for like two weeks and that's awesome. shows and like and from there i got like a manager and i signed to a record label and then i was touring with sort of electronic art artists and that was going really good for a couple of years and it started to slow down and i went back to like editing and um and yeah, I was just like happy to be editing and I like opened a little studio where I was doing post and I was and I had a little sound room and I was doing a bit of music here and there for some ads and for some documentaries and and, you know, it was all kind of just a lot of gig work and this and that and and just, you know, making stuff with my friends and then I reunited with Jason and and I was his assistant editor on this movie called Goon Last of the Enforcers, which is directed by Jay Baruchel, yeah. written by Jay Baruchel. And the three of us just got so close, like making this film and like, like it was a long process. I think it was like 10 to, it was almost a year actually of post on that film. So, and we were doing it at Jay's house. So we, for like 10 to 12 hours a day for almost a year, we were like, making sequences together for this film, but also like listening to music together, auditioning music, auditioning against different scenes, talking about history of movies, watching scenes together. And we all like our tastes just got really like intertwined and we kind of sharpened each other's swords a little bit. And then, um, you know, I was like making little music stuff for, for Jason, for stuff he was pitching and for sizzle reels. And one of those things was dark side of the ring and I got a chance to do the do the pilot with him. And then Jay got another movie and I got to uh, I got to edit, lead edit his film. But also one of the guys who did some of the music for Goon Last of the Enforcers, he wanted him to do the music and but he had never done a feature film before. And I I knew the ropes for post and I had done a lot of music and I was doing music with Jason. So then it kind of just it, it's just a lot of work, a lot of like, I'll, I'll scratch my back if you scratch yours. And, and, you know, it took me 15 years to get good enough at editing to edit a real movie. And it took me those same 15 years to get good enough to at music production to like make sure. music good enough to go in a, any of those movies. And just luckily I found a couple of people that wanted me to do both. And, um i've not done done a, been doing a ton of editing over the last couple of years because dark side of the ring especially has got has been really popular and i've been doing a lot of that and now this new movie with jason anyway that's a long way of saying no uh, i've always done both and it's just i've been really lucky that that the main thing has been the music lately and i love it and i feel like i feel like i've been training my whole life to do this in some ways you know no that's a uh, that's a great story man the the way that you describe kind of working your way up i think is is what well, is awesome but i think that it is something that people need to kind of like understand i teach high school for a day job i went to film school after being in education for a while, this show started um, and I had a conversation with a director that just kind of inspired me. Like, essentially, I had a thing for a movie, idea for a movie, but I had no idea how I wanted to make it, um, what we were doing. And a director that I was interviewing pretty much said, you're not going to learn until you do it type of a thing. And that conversation, you know, really kind of lit a fire. And we, we made a movie um, that had some success looking like watching it now, five years later, it's horrible. It's rough to watch <laughs> after, but it did inspire me to like go to film school and learn. And then you do make connections and you do like, you know, the contract stuff or whatever it may be. And so that to hear you say that, that, that like, you know, here is uh, Andrew and he has done, exactly like the road that like everybody who has come before says it is but the kids in high school nowadays are like very much 
instant gratification yeah. and talking to some of them. Um, so I have seniors right now talking to a few of them about like what next year holds. It's like, well, I'm going to be a computer engineer. And it's just kind of like, well, oh, just, just like that, huh? You're going to be a computer engineer tomorrow. And it's just kind of like, no man, like it comes with a lot of work, but once you're finally there, you, I would imagine, especially in your case, that you appreciate that ride of getting there. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like, uh, you know, I've I've licked a lot of wounds, so to speak. Um, <laughs> but you know, I mean, it hasn't it, it hasn't been all glorious, and it hasn't been all bad. You know, for uh, sure. And you know, lot, learned a lot of things the hard way, and learned, but learned some of the right things because I get to pay my bills making music <laughs> for movies and awesome TV now. So I I'm happy about that. We'll come back to kids in a minute, but I got, cause I'm a, I'm a pro wrestling fan for like 30 years, man. So I gotta say the dark side of the ring show, you guys, the work that you have done on that and some of the stories that you have found, um, were you, a, are, are you, were you, a pro wrestling fan before going into that job? Um, I was, you know, I, I hate, I hate this. Like this is the God's honest truth. And I, I hate saying it because I've, I've now witnessed many people say exactly the same story to Jason and Evan. And they kind of like, like, I, I feel like it hurts their feelings a little bit. And so I, I hate, but it's the truth, which was like, I was crazy about wrestling until the attitude era kind of started mm -hmm. and then i just you know i don't know i don't know if it was just the age i was or if it just i started losing uh interest in the subject or if sure. i just got way more passionate about other things like playing my guitar and no, you know, listening fair. to grunge records or whatever sure. it was in that time but but no, I used to go to my buddy's place for every WrestleMania and every pay-per-view. Like, it, you know, we had one friend who his dad, it's like the one kid's parents who, who would let him get the pay-per-view. Mm -hmm. And we'd all go over and play Sega Saturn until the pay-per-view started. And, you know, uh, uh, you know, so, these, like, I, so like a lot of the stuff that we've, a lot of the, you know, the big WWE guys. Like yeah. I, I watched the Montreal screw job on a pay-per-view when it right. happened. Right, right. I, like I remember like like when uh when Shawn Michaels threw Marty Janetti through the window at the barber shop yeah. at hey, Brutus the Barber Beefcakes barbershop. Yeah. That had been the most violent thing I'd ever seen in my life up until that point. Like when Papa Shango like put the curse on Ultimate yeah, man. and the black tar Whatever, running yeah. down his face and uh, you know all of like all of that stuff you know it it is foundational to like sort of my tastes and my my like uh my i guess my some of my instincts as a storyteller and as a musician and all of these things um but yeah i just i don't know what it was like some like something about the attitude era and when things really when all the when the companies consolidated i just kind of like slowly sort of faded away from it but well, there's still there still has not been better entertainment within pro wrestling than when the con the monday night war you know saga yeah. when they were actually competing um when they had to you know beat each other and you had the nwo versus dx like what are they going to do versus what are they going to do it's still i don't know if it'll ever get better than what that was um I, I just remember like some of the last angles that were starting to like i was starting to kind of get like what like i remember i remember they had like diesel they had like different guys come and be oh, diesel yeah. and razor ramon yeah and I was like, it's obviously not the same guys. And then it was like, it's supposed to be like a joke, but it, like it wasn't really playing. And I was just like, right. like a, a lot of the magic started to wear off, and they when when that stuff started happening too. I think. Sure. So, but yeah, like, I it it was it was huge for me, and I I totally fell off until until Jason started telling me the story of Bruiser Brody, 
And I was like, who's that? I don't know anything about that story. And he told me the story. And I'm like, man, that sounds like an awesome documentary. He's like, yeah, we, we want to do it as a documentary. We want to do it as like a prestige documentary, like an Errol Morris saw one. Cause you know, those guys have been cutting promos. So like their interviews would be so much better than like, it'd be the best interviews you'd ever get. And we just get them talking straight down the lens. Like they're doing a promo, but they're doing, telling these like crazy stories behind the scenes. We'll do these reenactments and like, we'll get like the music will just be, you know, like Philip glass and like, but like and maybe tangerine dream and all this. And I was just like, man, this sounds awesome. And then like, let me do some stuff. And like, and I got one point, Jason had like made Jason and Evan, I guess had made like a video like a mock-up where like Jason is talking as if he's telling the story of Bruiser Brody as if he is Abdullah the Butcher or something. Mm -hmm. And then how do you do like the reenactments, but it's with Jason's wrestling action figures oh. and they're using the music from like, uh, you know, I don't, it, it sounds like some kind of uh, Errol Morris type of music and, and, you know, big sound effects and stuff. And I'm like, man, this is awesome. I hope we get to do this. And then they got to do the first one. And then they sat on it for a long time and then, yeah. and then suddenly we've got green lit. So, uh, and now I've, you know, some of the stories I really knew going into it and some of them were super obscure and new to me and sh shocking. And, and I got to say, like, regardless of my involvement of it, like at least a third of those episodes, I feel like are some of the, you know, maybe not the greatest documentaries ever made, but like could sit, sit on a shelf with some of the greatest TV documentaries that ever made. Like I, you know, I feel like there's, they made like testament to those guys making some movies that actually like say something are really important, like actually fixed shit in the world, you know, actually are like are really enlightening about like serious health and like, like abuses of power and like crazy stuff you know i crazy. so i'm so proud of them and i'm so happy i get to work on it and and it's such an awesome show so they um they have really uncovered some of the stuff within that sport that i think that didn't necessarily get the the shine before that show like the amount of toll that it takes on them you know, both physically, obviously, but like the emotional toll of all that stuff and the way that they got that stuff out. And then, so you as the composer to this show, because you're hitting all the, you're hitting all the feels with Shawn Michaels throwing Janetti through the window. I can remember that. Warrior getting sick and throwing up ooze. I totally remember that. Like <laughs> all the, so when you were composing that, the episodes for that show, like I got to imagine for you to sit down and write music for that. Like you're, you gotta have been like, holy shit, this is some heavy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> I think I had to do Benoit both parts and new Jack in the same <laughs> month. Man. And, uh, and, and uh it was a super busy i was also working on a feature at the time and i like didn't leave my studio like i slept on the couch in my studio for the month pretty much Jeez. and the the benoit one if any if anyone out there hasn't seen it if you have any interest they, I, I gotta say it's like one of the one of the like it's an amazing amazing documentary and it there is a light at the end of the tunnel but man it is the it will drag you through hell it is so sad it is so heart-wrenching and you know i was like uh yeah i felt felt every every like uh every note of that one for yeah. sure that the way that you know that thing was cut testament to the the interview footage to the the b-roll to your score music but it was almost like watching you know the way that you called it benoit one benoit two it really is it's like two different movies almost because you yeah. you know you kind of follow him on his rise at the beginning and then you start to see the downward trajectory take take form that there may be some underlying issues there um but uh, man, yeah, that second episode when they get into the the events that actually happened. But the one thing I'll say as as a filmmaker, I thought was very it was really informative and cool to see them do this was that they they 
told both sides of what was going on that day. And they told they told like all this this stuff that had already been, you know, regurgitated by the media a thousand times. That I think anybody who knows who Chris Benoit was had seen a thousand times at the point of the show coming out. But then they also took the time to you know do the interviews with the wrestlers and the producers and the you know the people who were at the pay per view that night, wondering what the hell was going on. I think that just added to the emotion of the entire situation it encapsulated it all really well and there's 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 like moments in that in the second one too is like uh you know where the uh <laughs> former uh former pro wrestler turned neuroscientist yeah, yeah. shows up with you know like almost like the the cavalry coming over the hill the hill of with like scientific like uh you know hypothesis of what has happened which is unexplainable like which is like unfathomable praise but you've gone through the just hell and torment and just like how could this have ever happened and then suddenly there's a guy who's a neuroscientist slash farmer pro wrestler who has studied it and knew Benoit and had a hypothesis that this was going on. And now there's a, there's a new, there's a new chapter opening of him. Like we're going to study his brain and we're going to make sure this doesn't happen. And, and you know, yeah. there's, there's just, there's, there's like layer after layer of that, that, that it just, I can't believe, I can't believe the movie they made. And, and it was such, it's such a, you know, I'm so blessed to have gotten to work on it. And, you know, it was gut wrenching to work on for sure, but it's like, it's so powerful as well. You know, the wild thing is, is the neuroscientist that you're, you're referring to at the end there. Cause that is when there is no seemingly happy ending, that's about as happy ending as you can get. But he retired from wrestling for fear that that was going to happen to him. Cause he had like three concussions. I can remember that yeah. like thinking, cause he was, just on the cusp of being like the true asshole heel because he had like the persona of like almost like a modern day horseman rick flair where he knew yeah. he was smarter and everything else but he kept getting hurt and that's what made him leave but i do, i do remember watching wrestling as a fan and every time he just it's one of those things every time he got picking up steam picking up steam like you'd watch him, you know, hit his head or something and be like, Ooh, that didn't look yeah, too kosher. Like that looked like it, it could have hurt, but on a more happier note, more wackier note, kids versus aliens. <laughs> yeah. um, the, the film uh, after listening and like trying to find like your actual uh, songs on your YouTube channel, you have three of them that I found and they are, I think a good, representation about the array of music that you you know kind of put together for this do you have a, a favorite song or track that you did for kids versus aliens oh uh, well um so the three that are on there it's the opening credits theme the end credits theme and then there is there's one from the middle called dive in which is sort of the orchestral suite that contains all of the theme main themes mm. of the movie but it's it is from from it's like in a really uh important part of the story that 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 piece of music actually plays and that one of the three has got to, i'm sort of the most proud of i guess because um i've worked with a lot of soloists and different ensemble sizes on all of the stuff i've scored before but this is the first movie i i actually hired a full orchestra i work i i hired the cape town philharmonic orchestra to record all the orchestral parts this is about half the music wow. in the movie so it was a huge career accomplishment for me to like you know go from you know basically being a sort of one man music producing act to to like like i wanted jason i wanted jason's return to feature filmmaking to feel like a the biggest blockbuster possible and i felt like this warranted it because it's like you know it's horror but it's also action and it's also sci sci-fi and it's also fantasy because the the aliens are kind of like have this like ancient and like you know 
uh, almost medieval feel about them in some ways. Yeah. And uh, so I was like, well, we got to get the orchestra in there just to, to do all of that part of it justice. And, you know, and then mixing it with the synths, which is the kind of thing I'm doing all the time. And then, and then there's also like action figure commercial type mm -hmm. music and other stuff, which is fun. Um, so, so of the, of those three, the, the dive in one, I'm the most proud of And it was, it was the most work. Cause I, as well as like, it's one thing to, <laughs> to write 85 minutes of music. It's another thing to write 35 minutes of music that has to get notated. Yeah. It just happens to be in arm's reach. Oh. Um, notated and mm. shipped and proofread and played by, you know, 60 musicians and uh, like across the world and, and, and recorded and then sent back and then edited and mixed and incorporated with the film and incorporated with the synthesizers that I'm doing in my studio in Toronto and all that stuff. So, uh, a lot of a lot of work went into to getting all that stuff uh written approved shipped performed recorded shipped, shipped back. back edited incorporated in the movie mixed with the movie you know all that so yeah. I'm, I'm, I, that's the stuff i'm really proud of yeah, well i mean rightfully so i would say that's pretty rad i was gonna ask it doesn't sound like you got to if you talking about it Chip, did you have you did you get to go to any of the live recordings or meet anybody from the orchestra at all only on zoom um because i had a kind of big life event happen in the middle of this which was my first daughter was born oh congratulations uh, man five weeks before five weeks before i got the first cut of the movie so um i i had uh, you know, I'd written, as I mentioned, I'd written stuff for Jason, uh, in October. I, they, they shot in no, most of November. They edited, uh, they, they edited December, January, uh, December, January, February ish. I started mm -hmm. seeing stuff in February. My daughter was born the beginning of March. Wow. And then I got the, I got, I got a cut come to me ready to like, like basically the locked cut after they did all the notes and stuff mm -hmm. the second week of August. And wow. so, um, I, I'd known, I obviously knew that this movie was coming up and also that my daughter was going to be born and it's like, and I wanted to do the orchestra and the only way that it was going to be possible for me to do all of those things and be present was, uh, for me to outsource the recording of it and mm -hmm. and i interviewed a bunch of there's a bunch of different orchestras around the world that you know due to covid19 they you know their their orchestral calendars like their their seasons got postponed and yeah. so they were looking for other ways to make money and a lot of them started different recording kind of services uh mm -hmm. re remote recording services and i talked to a bunch of them and and South Africa, I had some weird serendipity with them. And I mean, also they were great to work with. And, and then, so I, I, they were the ones that I ended up uh, hiring and it just meant that I had to be on zoom like at two in the morning for like eight, st starting at two in the morning for like eight hours on a Jeez. couple, couple of days, which is okay. Cause I was barely sleeping anyway. Cause I had a newborn in the house. Yeah. Baby. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I would have liked to have gone and been physically there obviously, but like, uh, they did an awesome job they, and the conductor, this guy named John Walton, who ended up doing ex some extra or orchestration and stuff for me on the fly when I needed it for a couple of bits, who was just amazing. And he was so communicative and I was kind of in his ear the whole time. So I could kind of give him some slight adjustments and yeah, it was, it was, it was really cool. And it, it, it was also like a good way for me to dip my toe into, into like, you know, using a, 
like a much bigger weapon than sure. I was used to. You know, the or- or the orchestra is this giant organism of any any of uh, any of them are better musicians than I am, and you know, uh, can be you know somewhat intimidating, <laughs> but you know, I got some nice compliments and uh, you know some 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 eye rolls as well but uh you know i i think the music works perfectly in the film and i think any of them that would see it will be proud of it so yeah no i a thousand percent agree with you man i think that that is wild to think of just sitting and watching them play your music and trying to collaborate from you know halfway across the world is 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 pretty rad to think that you're on a zoom call in south africa as they're performing your music for this film that's shot over here that's that's big picture stuff um the film just came out on friday everyone who i know who has who has watched it uh they've enjoyed the hell out of it it is such a fun ride you you talked about at the beginning uh how it's not a uh it's not a, like a long two hour you know thing it's 75 80 minutes but it's like a tight 80 minute movie that doesn't have a lot of bs or stuff that you could be like well this movie was a seven but it would be like an eight and a half nine if they would have cut out the 15 minutes of you know whatever like there's no downtime really in this thing once it starts going it's like just the whole the whole time they're fighting aliens in the most over-the-top fashion that you could fathom i mean i couldn't fathom it until i saw it on the screen i was like holy shit where did this come from but uh i i feel like it's like i told jason it's like an arcade game or something it's like you put your quarter in and then you're just running from one side of the screen to the other until the until your quarter runs out just like beating stuff up and mashing buttons and there's explosions and there's flashing colors and uh yeah uh, yeah yeah it's it, it was a blast to work on and you know and i love i love working with jason i think he's he's got a like he's he's just got an amazing he's an amazing director he's a he's amazing with his cast he's amazing with building these sequences and you know i think that he was just like he wanted to make a movie that was all killer no filler Mm -hmm. uh for you know to be a bit cliche but that's you know there's no filler you know (laughs) And, and, uh, you know, I admire that about him and I admire that he like, didn't want to sit around and dwell on any, but at the same time, I don't feel like you're missing any, you're not missing any character development or backstory flashback or or, like the, the casting and the dialogue is strong enough that you kind of know who all of these people are like within seconds of Mm -hmm. seeing and experiencing them. Yeah, and, I was gonna say if you don't know, they they pretty much catch you up like you're part of the, like you're going to the party with them almost. Like you know, yeah. like which kids are the jerks, which kids are the cool ones, who the nerds are, all that kind of stuff. Like instantaneously, hundred yeah. percent. Um, do you have anything else coming up this year that we would see your stamp on? Versus you know, kids versus aliens. Anything to be on the lookout for for you? Uh, well. Tales from the Territories, which was the spinoff of Dark Side of the Ring, just finished, which was uh, which was Jason and Evan, as well as The Rocks Company, which was pretty crazy. Uh, I did all the music for that as well. That just wrapped up. Um, I'm working on a video game that I can't talk about, uh, and I'm working on another thing for Jason, uh, which is probably very obvious what it is but hasn't been announced yet and uh therefore i can't i am not technically allowed to say what it is (laughs) but um uh all i could say is lots and lots more stuff coming from me and jason and others that you may have collaborated with right on man the uh the territory documentary that'll be that sounds like that'll be just as good because they haven't that has not been done 
justifiably yet. So that'll be cool to to be able to check out. Yeah, it's well, it's ten episodes, and each one is about a different territory. Oh, okay, and um, it's they're kind of like fish stories. They're not. It's a, it's a very different tone than Dark Side. Um, mm -hmm. Like they're kind of like. Uh, you have sort of a round table of a bunch of wrestlers from oh, each okay. different territory and they're kind yeah. of they're telling the just craziest stories and there are reenactments that are very similar to dark side um but the the overall tone is and the tone of the music like the music is like a lot of 60s 70s 80s kind of yeah. sounding stuff um <laughs> and so they're they're kind of these just like not tall tales, but tales that have gotten tall over years of, of telling them for sure. And, and, you know, and paying tribute to like, you know, guys like Roddy Piper and guys from who were around in the territories yeah. days who have, you know, passed on. And uh, there there's one that's all about the Andy Kaufman, Jerry Lawler. Angle, oh, nice. But it's all from Jerry Lawler's POV. Standpoint? So it's Jerry Lawler basically telling the inside like what it, what that whole angle was like from the wrestling side out like we've seen the andy kaufman right. biopics and and all of this stuff but this i feel like this is maybe the first time when that someone's made a significant documentary of like from the wrestling Sorry. side and, and jared jared is there and the other guys from memphis to talk about those days and who was in on it and who wasn't in on it and like sure. how much they talk about it. so you know um but yeah it's uh it's available now so uh, oh nice i'll have to go check that out yeah yeah that, the uh the video game that you said you couldn't mention yet but with that do you uh because you've now done like feature film uh series episodic video game like do you do you find that like the uh, the series is the most challenging just because of the time constraint or what do you, what do you think is the most, the hardest to compose? Um, this, yeah, it's funny. Like, um, when, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a, like a comic book artist. Mm -hmm. uh, like I was really into spawn and like, <laughs> and shit like that. And I really like wanted to like draw comic books. And I remember seeing this interview with Frank Miller where he said, where he's talking about like, the reason why comic books are so great and why it's an art art unlike any other is because there's such like uh fast turnaround like every these guys got to do 22 pages a month every single month like until they die basically like that sure. and i feel like working on the tv show it's like like i didn't become a comic book artist but this is like the music equivalent of that where it's like i'm doing about I'm doing about 20 to 30 minutes of music for the TV show every week while it's going mm. and, and every week there's a new one. So I've got to kind of like keep that, keep up that pace. So there's like an energy to that where that forces me to like write differently and the results come out differently. And it's, that's really exciting. Um, now I've done, a, I've done 30 dark sides and 40 or sorry, 30 dark sides and 10 territories which so, so I've gotten pretty good at that now where like I kind of I kind of know what my dance moves are a little bit and um so it's I'm in a good rhythm to do that and I've done the most of that. Video game music is uh it's really difficult because it's like you got to you got to build like a composition that's like usually like four different pieces of music that have to like fit on top of each other mm. and, and be looping for like, could be, could loop for, you know, five minutes up to like 30, depending on how long it takes someone to do a level. Right. And, that, and usually there's like, it's an exploration level, like tier of the music. And then there's like a stealth tier of the music. And then there's like an action tier to the music. And then there's like a either boss or like a, transition in and out or like like win loss and so you got to write it so it's it's very dense and it's like it's an iterative process with the developers of the game so you send them stuff and and they like implement it into the game and it like might take weeks or months for them to implement it and then you get notes back and then you have to like 
maybe take this thing apart. So it's, it's, it goes a lot slower and it's a different, you got to wrap your header because you're kind of like building a puzzle because you don't want like something from a, you, you don't want anything to clash. And yeah. that's, re that's really hard. Um, but it's, it's super fun. And when you play the game and it's your music and it's like, it's a really awesome feeling. And, and then movies, it's like something in between because it's like, like you get a little bit more time you get a little bit more resources for the amount of music that you have to do than like TV. Um, but it's, you know, it, it's usually like, it's about a, as much as I would write on maybe four episodes of dark side in the same, or roughly the same amount of time, but it's the process of like turning it over to the mix and, and notes and all of that stuff can kind of like, like, uh, you know, just everyone's kind of working on it at a different clip than, than on TV. And, 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 you know, there's more time to like sand the rough edges in the feature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I hope that wasn't too long winded way no. of saying like they're, they're all, they're all really fun. They all have the different challenges and rewards. I, dark side, I, I'm so lucky with Dark Side in that like it is such a great series, but also we get Jason and Evan really wanted to make every episode be like a different genre of cinema at time. It, like all like they all fit within the the realm of the show, but also there's a Twilight Zone episode. There's a you know there's a episode that's like like a country like, like it's almost like country music there's like the mm. one that's like 90s japanese kind of arcade music incorporated and like there's one that's like conan the barbarian meets mm -hmm. you know there's one that's like a french mafia film it, you know like so i get to like i get to ex do a mini version of like almost all these different cinematic genres with with dark side so i don't get bored of it uh for sure yeah and so yeah Right on, man. Well, Andrew, again, congratulations on the Rad soundtrack. Congratulations on, I mean, and thank you for sharing some of, not just for Kids vs. Alien, but, you know, everything else that you have uh, accomplished. It was awesome getting to talk to you, man. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It's a... Uh fun to uh fun to chat about it and i'm i'm so stoked that you loved kids versus aliens because we love it and i'm so stoked that you love dark side of the ring because yeah i'm i this is other than my daughter this is all i do all day every day <laughs> and i really care about it and so it's really awesome to meet people that care about it too so right on man every the last thing i always do is there like a preferred outlet like instagram or twitter or anything that you post like what you're working on so people can kind of keep track stay up to date uh probably instagram is the best one ango underscore composer there you go ango ango which is just short for andrew gordon right on man andrew thank you again buddy thanks so much Jimmy.